This is a conversation between John Viveki, the creator of the Awakening from the Meaning Crisis series, and the philosopher Jules Evans on the book that changed John's life and inspired his work, What is Ancient Philosophy? by Pierre Adol. This was part of Rebel Wisdom's regular book club event, recorded with our members in our digital campfire. And to find out how to join calls like this, to ask questions and to meet others interested in these ideas, check out the show notes below. And I hope you enjoy the film. Hi everybody, welcome to Rebel Wisdom Book Club. Uh, my name is Jules Evans, I am a philosopher and writer, and I'm really pleased to be joined by John Vaveki today. Um, for, um, for the latest session of the book club. John is a professor of psychology and cognitive science at the University of Toronto. I know that many of you are uh, fans of his uh, and follow his um, great courses online like the Awakening from the Meaning Crisis uh, course on YouTube, very popular lecture series. Um, and John has um, picked uh, a book by a French classical um, scholar, a great scholar called Pierre Addo, who really revolutionized the modern understanding of ancient Greek philosophy and Roman philosophy. Um, and I'm very glad that you picked this book, John. Um, I, this uh, changed my life as well, actually, this book. I mean, this is, this, he, he's a little known, but a fantastic writer uh, and, and, and reviver of, of ancient philosophy. Um, so, uh, why did you choose this book, uh, and what does it mean to you? Well, thank you, Jules, and it's a great pleasure to be here. And I enjoyed your book, by the way. I read it, and I, I, I suspected yeah. that there might have been that influence when I read your book. Uh, so, uh, I, I'm glad to I'm glad to see that that expectation was fulfilled. Um, <laughs> so, um, why did I choose this book? I, I chose the I chose this book because I'd read an essay in an anthology on Socrates, the figure of Socrates, in an anthology by Hedo called uh, Philosophy of the Way of Life. And one of the things that um, I was searching for, this goes a little bit into my own personal biography, is I was searching for something that I had encountered when I initially encountered philosophy, but then very quickly dropped off the table. Uh, so I had been brought up uh, in, in a fundamental, fundamentalist Christian family. I broke from that. And I went into university. Uh, like, you know, religion al always leaves this taste in your mouth uh, for something transcendent, something sacred. Um, and then uh, in philosophy, in university, I encountered the figure of philosophy leading the Republic, and it, it, it blew me away. And I saw in that, and so if you'll allow me to bend this and explain it if needed, I read the Republic religiously. I didn't read it just sort of, uh, like, although you, they were doing the standard thing about here's an argument and here's an argument, uh, right, which now modern scholarship is largely deeply criticizing. Perhaps we can come back to that. Um, I was reading it much more like, oh, I want to be like Socrates. I want to understand what he's doing. I want, And that was more and more. I want to understand what this project of the love of wisdom is and how it's transformative and how one can, can become godlike. And so, uh, you know, I, 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 I was reading stuff around. And I happened to see a reference to Hado, the philosophy is a way of life. I forget where I read the original reference. Uh, and then I started reading that and that was like, oh, and then I went and I got, what is ancient philosophy? And the thing was by this time, uh, like, I, I, like I said, I, I encountered philosophy, but uh, I, I think you'll back me up on this, at least for a very long time, the topic of wisdom drops off the table in philosophy courses. You, you're, you're, you're worrying about knowledge and skepticism and science and ethics, and, and that's all valuable. I don't, I'm not dissing that. But the project that I had initially you know, hungered for and had initially been nourished in, I was suddenly starving for again. So I had been doing a lot of transformative practices from Asiatic philosophy, Taoist and Buddhist practices. And I'd sort of relegated my hunger for wisdom you know, is, is to something that's couldn't be satiated uh, from the West. And then I, I encountered Hedo. And then I thought, wait. And then I read, I read what is ancient philosophy. And I started to see, no, no, no. There's a wisdom tradition here that is as viable, is as deep and as practicable as anything I was learning through the Buddhist and the Taoist traditions. And so this just opened up to my mind. And I was exposed to a bunch of ideas. I was exposed to the idea, which was very controversial when he proposed it. It's now verging on consensus. In a lot, because I read a lot of the Platonic scholarship now, 
that you know Plato's talking about important part, uh, important kind of non-propositional knowledge and knowing, and you know, and you know, and, and Gerson is at the University of Toronto, and so that's it, I, I, I'm hearing that there too, right? His work on ancient epistemology, and so that opens up, and then I get also in that book, I get introduced to the Stoics, and I start reading a, a, about that, and and I and then I also get introduced to this idea associated with Platonic dialogue of a logos that transcends individuals. And that's been taken up in my current project of Dialogos. So the mm -hmm. book was just, just that's why it's so important to me. It was, it was, it was pivotal for me. I, I, I feel my whole life turned around this book in, in certain ways. That's amazing. I mean, I, I really relate to that as well. I also, you know, was aware of kind of Eastern philosophies as something, this rich practical body of wisdom but I thought of Western philosophy as a bit academic, desiccated, theoretical, yeah. not. And, and, and so like for you, kind of had a broke it open for me and, and, and made me realize this is a very practical set of, uh, of wisdom and of techniques. And it sounds to me that you were really almost looking for something like transformative, almost like to take the place a little bit of Christianity or had Buddhism already done that for you? Well, Buddhism and Taoism were transformative, but. Um, I found that there were aspects of the psyche that were not addressed by them, um, or sometimes at least Western versions. I want to be very careful about uh, the, uh, the, the target of my next claim. But the Western versions that I encountered, uh, encountered tended to have an anti-intellectual streak in them that was like, hmm, that's problematic for me because, uh, like I said, I had encountered, uh, you know, Socrates and, and, and this and he struck me as much of a sage as any of the figures that I was meeting in the Eastern tradition. So there was something that wasn't quite going for me. So I did want something transformative. And then as you said, not merely informative, uh, but I wanted something that could, um, could stitch together the two, the, the, the two sides of my mind. You know, I almost have you know, McGillcrest's idea of the two hemispheres getting more into harmony and, and, and provoking more insight. Very shortly thereafter, I read uh, The Simplicity of Vision by Hadou, uh on, on Plotinus. And then, I, I, and then that started me on a long journey uh, through Neoplatonism and how deeply transformative that was. And then that got me to see what were some of the original practices within Christianity that had been to a large extent lost. And so it opened up a lot for me, tremendously. Mm. Um, I should say, by the way, to um, our audience, if you have um, what we're going to do, the format, which I should have said at the beginning, but I was so excited to talk to John. I forgot this bit is we're going to talk for about 45 minutes. Then we're going to open it up to you guys and your questions. If you think of a question now and you think you might forget it, you can put it in the chat and we will harvest them at the end. Um, we're talking about um, a French classicist, Pierre Addo, uh, just a very brief biography. He was born in, I think, around 1900. He died in the 80s. Um, he was a priest uh, in the Catholic Church briefly, but he left it when uh, one of the popes uh, you know, cracked down on certain modernist theologies. Um, it seems like he really then left you know, and looked for an alternative to Christianity in ancient philosophy. Um, he was, uh, you know, a very, uh, an academic uh, at, at a, one of the great French universities. Um, he started off, you know, a great classicist. He, he made his name studying Neoplatonism and really kind of soaking himself in Neoplatonism. But from what I remember, he had a, a kind of epiphany when he was in a bakery once in Paris. Uh, and he was getting into the real abstractness of Neoplatonism. And he looked around in this bakery and thought, what is this? How is this helping the people here? Mm. Uh, and that's when he got more into the kind of practical philosophies of, of the Hellenistic era, like Stoicism, uh, uh, Epicureanism, skepticism, and some of these kind of, the idea of philosophy as a practical way of life, which could help ordinary people. And one of the things that was, so that was very revolutionary, the idea of philosophy as a way of life. That would seem extremely odd in most philosophy departments in academia. Um, the second thing was that was revolutionary was this idea of spiritual exercises, that there are these practical techniques um, in ancient Western philosophy. This was a big influence on Michel Foucault, by the way, and his mm. ideas of what he called technologies of the self. Yes. Um, 
John, can you could you tell us a bit about, you know, these spiritual exercises and maybe give uh, one or two examples of what um, Hadur had in mind? Yeah, the important thing about the spiritual exercises and, and that they've become more and more emphasized in more recent literature um, is how they point to other aspects of our, our, our cognition uh, and our aspiration towards wisdom outside of propositional argumentation. Um, and that for me, this was the thing because uh, for me, my undergraduate, and even my, my graduate career in philosophy, um, philo philosophy was pretty much equated with argumentation and that doing philosophy was to do argumentation. Uh, and I'm not here to dismiss argumentation, that would be a mistake. But what I, what I saw in Hedo in his notion of ascesis, the spiritual exercises, were practices by which one could become more rational and more wise that were non-argumentative, and some of them are even non-discursive in nature. Uh, and for me, that allowed me to bridge into the non-propositional, non-discursive practices and transformations I was seeing within the Taoist and the Buddhist practices. And I was I, like, oh, I see, there's a possibility of transferring the kind of transformation I was getting here into the Western tradition and then that Western tradition was also bound up with argumentation. And that was a, that proposal was very attractive to me. Um, so one, one that I've talked about in public and I, I'm, I, I'm publishing on um, is a practice that Hado in the philosophy of way of life devotes a chapter to the view from above. Um, he, he argues it was prevalent through the Hellenistic uh, philosophies, uh, but it was especially well developed um, in Stoicism. And in fact, it is now recommended within the modern revival of Stoicism. So if you read Robinson, other people like that, I was there when, so in the same talk where I was talking about uh, the view from above as a transformative practice, uh, Daniel Robinson took us all through it. And Donald, Daniel, I can't remember which one it is. Donald. Donald took us through it. Um, and, and so uh, that, that association is very, 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 very strong. So the main idea of, uh, the argument I made about the transform, uh, the view from above. I'll first describe what it is, and then I'll describe how you can make tremendous sense of it, given some current philosophy that does talk about transformative experience, like the work of L.A. Paul and Agnes Callard, and some very cutting edge cognitive science. So the view from above is very much a contemplative practice in which you, uh, first of all, you take your perspective, your point of view um, in your room, let's say that you're in, and then you imagine rising above and seeing yourself from above sitting in the room, hence the view from above. And then you pull back and you see yourself within the building, render the roof of your building transparent, of course. And then you rise above to seeing the whole city, the whole country, the whole planet, and you can pull back, you can see the, you know, the whole solar system, you can go back even to the galaxy. And you, don't, and you don't just do that with space, you do it with time. You pull back and you try to see the deep past and the deep future. And then, and then you return back step by step in. And you may ask, well, what's the point of doing that? I mean, it's an imaginative <laughs> exercise that's fairly useless. Well, the point of doing that is, uh, first of all, it gets you out. And so it's very similar in some ways to, uh, you know, Asiatic contemplative practices in which you are dropping out of inferential thought. So you're not entertaining propositions. You're not doing what's called propositional knowing, you're doing a combination of procedural knowing and perspectival knowing. So what do I mean by those? Procedural knowing is knowing how to do something and it doesn't re result in beliefs, it results in skills. Um, and you have a special kind of memory studied in cognitive psychology called procedural memory, which is distinct from how you store semantic information, propositional memory. And whereas beliefs have a conviction of truth, skills have a sense of power. So they even have a different normative standard. You can do the same thing with perspectival knowing. That's not knowing that something's the case, like when you believe something, or knowing how, like when you have a skill. It's knowing what it's like to be. Thomas Nagel made it famous in one of his uh, seminal papers called What's It Like to Be a Bat, right? So this, is, uh, this isn't beliefs or skills. This, this is, these are uh, points of views and the perspective that is generated. The salience landscaping, knowing what it's like to be you here now in this state of mind, in this situation. And this is coming to the fore, by the way, in cognitive science, because we're studying this in virtual reality. So you might hear people in virtual reality talk about it was so real. 
Uh, I had it, right? I, and this is called the sense of presence. It's a sense of being present in that world and that world being present to you. That's that, right? That's that perspectival knowing. Mm. So what you're doing in, uh, in, in the view from love is you're learning how, procedural knowing, to transform your perspectival knowing so that you can change what you find salient and relevant. And that's what happens as you do this. What you find salient and relevant, what you foreground and background is shifting and changing. Now, we know that that already has tremendous powerful effects on your cognitive abilities. Uh, so there, there's many different theories that converge on this. I'll just mention two. But if you go and check the essay I wrote on this, I talked about four or five. But I'll just do two for the sake of brevity. One is construal level theory. There's increasing evidence, a lot of it robust, reliable, that if I move you to different levels of construal, different perspectival knowings, that will change your cognition, change how you think. You'll become more likely to be um, insightful. You'll be more able to self-regulate long-term. You'll be able to transform what you consider important or, re or relevant. Let me give you a more concrete example of this. And this, this is the work of my friend and colleague, Igor Grossman. And so it's called the Solomon effect. So let me, I'll just describe a typical situation. I give you a problem. And it's a problem that you're finding particularly difficult, really messy, and you're deeply involved in it. You're existentially enmeshed in it. And I ask you to describe it. And inevitably, without thinking, you'll describe it from the first person perspective and how it's relevant and salient to you. And then why you can't solve your problem. This is why people go into therapy, by the way. Then you get people to do this. Redescribe the same problem from a third person perspective as if somebody else was describing it. When people do that, they get insight into their problem. None of the propositions are changing. All that's changing is the perspective. This is called decentering. And that perspective alters you out of egocentrism, which is a kind of perspectival constraint. And when you relax that constraint, you become capable of thinking of things you couldn't think of before. And if you think about that, that's analogous to how, on, like, to how a child becomes more mature, right, as they overcome egocentrism. When you accuse an adult of being childish, you're almost always accusing them of being egocentric and therefore selfish in their behavior. So the view from above does that tremendously, right? It moves you to kind of the ultimate third person perspective. It changes your perspectival knowing so what you find salient and relevant. And then here's the deeper part of it. When you do that, when you change, when you get that knowing how to do the perspectival transformations and you get that perspectival transformation, people start to change their sense of identity. People change, so you have to start thinking of yourself in this. I, ha I have a series out there called The Elusive Eye. Just start seeing your, of yourself as more a way in which you're enacting um, in the world, what you're finding salient and relevant, what you're committed to. So the deepest, sort of at the bottom of perspectival knowing is the very process of co-identification. You're always doing this. You're always assuming identities and assigning identities. Right now, I'm the professor and you're the student. If I took that into my relationship with my, my partner, my morentic partner, that's a disaster. I have to assume another identity and assign another identity, and it's got to be coordinate with that situation. And, and this is one of the things, by the way, that was I found the key in Stoicism, Sto the Stoics, and I got this from Fromm's reading of the Stoics. The Stoics were always on about this agent arena co-identification. That's what I call participatory knowing. The, the knowing that is the knowing of yourself that allows you to know the other in relation to the self, etc. And the idea is when you do that, when you get the procedural knowing, to transfer, transform the perspectival knowing. If you do it long enough, you'll get a transformation of the participatory knowing. You'll actually transform individuals. And, and I'll stop there so uh, uh, Jules can say something. But for me, that was an answer to problems posed by L.A. Paul in her book on transformative experience. Mm, thank you. So, um, can you tell us a bit about that? There's a kind of, as, as you're basically in, uh, suggesting there, there's something therapeutic in what these philosophies do. 
that yeah. perhaps we can can I, I, I just as you're talking it was making me think of like cognitive behavioral therapy which clearly was of course. We, we we found it, it was inspired by ancient greek philosophy particularly stoicism makes me think of acceptance and commitment therapy as well the idea that we have certain beliefs or perspectives yeah. and we kind of get fixed in them so we can only see our situation from one perspective and we think that perspective is the total truth and the total reality or we have certain beliefs about ourselves and about the world and we're totally fused with those beliefs we can't see anymore that they're just yeah. just a way of putting it yes. you know what i mean like like we, like we a pair of glasses that we've worn so long we've forgotten we're wearing them and I, so I, use it, that, I use that metaphor all the time by the way uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and so something like the view from above and a lot of these techniques are like distancing cognitive distancing techniques saying this is you know try this perspective or or have you thought about looking at it like this to get that kind of flexibility is that right and is is there a kind of a, yeah. a, and could you tell us a bit about that kind of idea of philosophies as therapies and maybe you know some of the different ancient greeks ideas about that I mean, so this is one of the things that um, I think is central about Hellenistic philosophy. And Hadella talks about it. I think he talks about it in ancient, what is ancient philosophy? I think he also talks about it in philosophy of way of life, how there was something like, uh, you know, a, a, a meaning crisis in the Hellenistic period, uh, uh, something like uh, what I've talked about elsewhere is a kind of cultural domicide uh, because of all, uh, of all of the displacement and disruption by the, uh, after the collapse of Alexander's empire. And so the, the philosopher takes on a new definition as the physician of the soul. Uh, you know, Epicurus, call no man a philosopher who has not alleviated the suffering of others, right? So this therapeutic dimension um, was very much became central, um, but you can, but, but, but it, 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 it found a welcome home in the Socratic tradition uh, uh, of philosophy as a fundamental kind of transformative experience. Uh, you know, Socrates said that he was a midwife. He helped people to give birth to themselves, right? And so that's a fundamental, you know, pedagogical transformative view. And then the therapeutic view, uh, you know, integrates with that very well. Um, and the thing about things like um, CBT, for example, and as you, you, you're, you're absolutely correct, CBT has an explicit and direct heritage going back to Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius. Back, you know, explicitly cites them um a, 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 as influence but the thing i would i would i would argue is notice what's happening though right now in cbt cbt is increasingly and, and with good reason being integrated with mindfulness and other other forms of transformation that involve the transformation of attention and consciousness and perspectival knowing to strengthen right the 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 the, the more inferential uh kinds of practices that are central to CBT. And in that sense, I would say the new thing, CBT plus mindfulness, is actually getting closer to original stoicism than just CBT on its own. Because Hado, for example, you know, talk, talks a lot about uh, prosage, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, prochiron, right? You know, paying attention to how you pay attention and keeping things ready to hand, reminding, that's very similar to the Buddhist notion of sati, which is to remind, to remember, to bring it to bear. Um, so again, I think what we're seeing is a, a kind of reverse engineering of uh, of, of something closer to the spiritual exercises that were uh, original to Stoicism. You mentioned a word earlier, um, eschesis. Yes. And um, could you unpack that for us? Uh, how it relates to asceticism things like christian asceticism um and and i guess could you tell us a bit about you know the idea of, of training and habits because that was something that Hado brought to life for me how good the greeks were on the kind of psychology of habit and you know the necessity of like doing something every day so i'm um, so asceticism as you as you already mentioned it's the etymological origin of our word asceticism um, and like many of the terms from ancient philosophy, this term has a long history that has taken it very far from its original meaning. Uh, uh, just to give you a convergent piece of evidence, our notion of cynicism, which is suspecting everybody of having ulterior motives, has very little to do with the ancient philosophical tradition known as cynicism. Um, in a similar manner, 
our notions of asceticism have largely turned into notions of self-denial, um, often self-loathing, self-punishment. Uh, the prototypical image people often get, because I've asked them, what you think of when I say asceticism is the, the monk flagellating themselves uh, kind of thing. Um, that's not what the original meaning of asceticism is. I would propose to you that instead of hearing it as self-denial, you should hear it as practices of self-transcendence. Uh, and, and, and so properly speaking, if you understand it that way, the view from above is ascetics. It is a way of training you to get you skills and get, to get, to get, you know, the taste, the habitual taste of a certain state of mind, a certain state of consciousness that helps you to overcome the vice of egocentrism and practice the virtue of, of, uh, of being more ontocentric, centered on reality. I, I want you to remember that the word virtue originally means the, 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 the power to do, the power to do something. Like it's, it's a, that's why we still have phrases like in virtue of, uh, due to, right? Because of. And so the, the, the ancient philosophy realized that there's a big difference, therefore, I am getting to your point, Jules, uh, a big difference between philosophical discourse talking and the repeated kind of practice, a thesis you need to do, practices of self-transcendence in order to get the, the and, and I'm going to play on both sides of the word habitus, right? To inhabit, to live within, that's like a perspectival, participatory knowing, it's a way of being, a way of life. You have to shape yourself so you fit a way of life. You know this when you go to another culture, you don't immediately fit in. You can't inhabit it, even though you're physically there. You have to shape your points of view. You have to shape your sense of identity and, and so that you can inhabit it. That's habitus, right? But that's also, right, the, the ability to do things you couldn't do before. And, 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 and the primary idea here is if you develop skills that empower you to inhabit a, a new way of life, you can inhabit a world that attracts you towards the best life. You can move to a way of living and being and seeing that attracts you into a kind of a continual self-transcendence. This was the virtue sophrason, so that you're constantly tempted to the better life. And, and, and before you say that's so crazy, again, I'm gonna use a, a, a thing that Hado made famous which is an ancient Greek um, uh, ratio analogy. As the child is to the adult, the adult is to the sage. Most of us, right, have changed our salience landscaping and our sense of identity, and we're outside of our own egocentrism, that we don't fall prey to the kind of impulsive egocentric greed that children have for, like, toys. I would, are you, gonna, my, you know, if you, I've had two sons, and when they're, like, five or six years of age, Man, they love toys. Like, and, 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 you, and, you, and you know what it's like? You try to remember what it was like playing with your toys, how they were so alive, and you're an adult, you're just sort of like, you're trying to do it, and you can't, and you're not really tempted by the toys anymore, right? It doesn't mean we're not tempted by other things. The point I'm making is you, we've all changed, so things that were overwhelmingly compulsively attractive are not anymore, and we are attracted to things that have a larger scope perhaps more depth, more reality. Here's the claim. You can habituate yourself, train skills and virtues, perspectives and identities that will tempt you towards the best, most comprehensive, deepest life that a human being can live. Mm. Um, obviously, I mean, in terms of that training to have that inner resistance to uh, this is the idea in stoicism, right? That the kind of uh, culture is insane, but you can become a citadel of wisdom. Uh, yeah. and, and, and Christianity takes some of these practices, but turns it into like a culture. Like, yeah. you know, you go and join a monastery, say, or, you know, they have that idea of the kind of the sangha, the community. Um, I mean, then, you know, Haddo rescues this idea of, of ancient philosophy as, as kind of practices for the individual. And it becomes very popular in the like 80s and 90s and noughties with people like Foucault, who's kind of a libertarian individualist, and people like like me, who's who I'm, I'm a, an individualist yeah. as well. So my question is like, um, 
Well, wh- why do you think there's been this big revival of of the of ancient philosophy today? Um, and do do you think that we, you know it can be enough for the individual that we don't really need the kind of community? We can we can use these practices to become strong and resilient and wise, even if we're in a crazy society. Or, or, or is there a kind of is there a lack of the community aspect there? This is my my big kind of question with like modern stoicism and things. Does, sure, it, does sure. it work? Yeah. What are no. your thoughts? So, uh, I mean, that's interesting because maybe it's because I was already in a sangha. When I read Hado, I was picking up on his constant reference to that these philosophies were practiced in communities. He talks about the schools a lot and there's a community. And we get a terrific sense. And let's remember, for example, you know, especially, you know, the platonic communities, the academy is, is conjoined to the gymnasium, right? And, and embodied body work together is also uh, expected. Um, and, and so for me, um, I saw both of those aspects. I, I'm not trying to one up you, Jules, or anything like that. I, I, I saw that, and I, I totally agree with you. Uh, that, you know, that's why uh, Foucault and technologies of the self and care of the subject, he, like he's really zeroing in on us because he's he's trying to, you know, pick up on. And you know, Hedo does write the book, you know, the Inner Citadel about Stoicism as building this Inner Citadel, and, and, and so I'm not denying that. That's clearly there. But I was deeply intrigued by the Sanger-like aspects that I was actually encountering in what is ancient philosophy. And as I've already mentioned, I was deeply intrigued by something that has become central to my work right now and my thinking, which is the idea of dialogos, this idea that two people in conversation can engender the logos um, that is something that neither one of them is individually creating, you know, and they both get to a place uh, collectively that they couldn't got, get to individually. And I thought, wow, that's you know, that's very important because I had seen that at work. I had been enough, I'd been in enough meditation sanghas and where, right, it's, that's why there's always the three, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Like the Sangha has, has as much transformation on you as the teaching does, as does the role model of the Buddha, right? Mm-hmm. And so that really appealed to me. And at, at that same time, you know, you know, I, I was starting to get interested in, um, uh, what's called 4E cognitive science. Uh, well, this is the idea that cognition is inherently embodied, embedded, extended, and enacted. You know, one of my colleagues at U of T was Evan Thompson, right? Uh, and that whole idea, and I'm starting to think, you know, the whole idea of distributed cognition, and I did enough anthropology in graduate school that I got that sense of, uh, so I, I now have a phrase for this. I said, long before, long before the internet networked computers together, Right, culture networked human beings together and it released the power of distributed cognition. This has gone from being a slogan to something that is now, you know, increasingly garnering, you know, good empirical evidence that we can form a collective intelligence and we can transform it uh, so it, it, we can experience a kind of collective wisdom that transcends us and thereby helps again view from above, decenter us, radically transform it. And then I've been, I've been participating, I've been doing participant observation, participant experimentation in all of these emerging dialogical practices. Here's one, by the way, right? Uh, uh, all over the place, like at the STOA and Insight Dialogue and I send stuff circling on authentic relating. And, and, I, put, and I, I what I see is people, right? And, and people from all kinds of backgrounds talk, start talking about this experience in spiritual religious terms. And, and they're often fumbling. And that's the only language. I'm not using this as some kind of proof of metaphysical entities. I'm talking about the fact that they get a sense, of, you know, a profound meaning and transformation occurring and they, and they find it reliable and they keep coming back to it. And so all of this came together for me. And it's coming together for me right now. Um, and the idea that um, we need, we need a kind of like a meta practice. I call it a meta psychotechnology that helps us create our ecologies and practices. Um, and what it help, will help us to do is to curate them and coordinate them and check them and overcome the dangers of autodidactism. Um, and, and I think, um, I don't want to get into a political argument with you, 
right? But I, I, one of the criticisms I have of individualism as a political uh, philosophy ideology is precisely because it's neglect of what I think is now an undeniable fact to my mind, which is the power, the relevance, and the importance of distributed cognition. Most of our problem solving is done in distributed cognition. You and I did not make any of this technology. You and I did not invent the English that we're using, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, mm. um, so for me, I actually, that that initial, right? I saw a seed in Hado and it was con converging with all the stuff on distributed cognition that I was getting from the, the way there was a revolution going and it's still happening in cognitive science right at that time. I've, I've, I've been fortunate to, to be, be, by, be blessed by these sort of kairoses Ah, I mean, I, I love what you're saying about dialogue and co-creating and co-discovering and conversation as a means to kind of epiphanies. Um, uh, to me, it sounds, and I'm just, I'm interested in the kind of the heritage of it. To me, it sounds more Christian than uh, ancient Greek. I just don't, I don't know if the ancient, you know, I, I know you have the Socratic dialogues, in Plato, yep. but to me, they were always pretty one-sided. Like you know, uh, you know, the, Socrates kind of bludgeons his opponent into just saying, "Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes, Socrates, okay, right, Socrates." And then the Stoics are not great at dialogue. I mean, you have like kind of the letters, but they're kind of you know, Seneca. Uh, uh, the last thing you want if, if you lose a loved one is a letter from Seneca because they're just so kind of you know what I mean, biased and preachy. So I, but, I don't know if it's yeah, but go on, yeah. Well, I was going to say the, the thing about Stoicism a bit, is a bit of an accident of history, right? Uh, Hado actually points that out. You know, I think mm. he cites Plutarch or somebody talking about how actually what the Stoics mostly did was a kind of question and answer thing with you. And we and you actually get that sense if you read Epictetus. And, mm. and, uh, and when you're reading the meditations, it's also uh, Aurelius is, right, he's actually questioning and answering himself. It's mm. the meditations is properly, uh, you know, and Hado also made that argument, is properly read dialogically. Seneca's letters, I get your point. They're, like He can be a little bit, like, I get it. But, you know, Hado points out that, no, no, if you, and this goes back again, how this therapeutic aspect. Uh, it, remember that the, the founder of, you know, the, well, the founder, perhaps, you know, uh, uh, Antisthenes, the person who, you know, teaches Diogenes, and that becomes cynicism and stoicism. When he was asked, what did he learn from Socrates? He said, I learned how to dialogue with myself. Right. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so that idea that there's actually uh, a tremendous dialogical component uh, to um, to Stoicism, I, I think you could make a good historical case for it. It's clearly mm -hmm. also the case in Epicurus, because Epicurus says, you know, do this and also always get together with a friend and do this and recite and talk to each other and examine yeah. each other. So uh, I think I'm it can gonna... be a pretty strong case. When you were talking about it, it reminded me of um, Abraham Maslow, and he talks about the lecture as a means to an ecstatic experience. And I suppose yeah. he's coming from that great kind of Jewish tradition of kind of dialogue as well, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, wisdom through dialogue and, and, and funny dialogue. Um, I want to ask you about how these ideas we've been discussing and, and ancient philosophy and its revival today um, relate to what you um, called the meaning crisis. Oh, and yeah. maybe I know that's a big topic and, and you, you explore it in, 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 a, you know, in the whole lecture series. Could For people who maybe haven't seen that, could you give us a little idea um, about what do you mean by that? I think a lot of us will have a sense of it, but could you try and capture it and then maybe say how, how the revival of ancient philosophy might fit in? Right. <laughs> so thank you for the caveat. Jules, because I'm going to rely, I'm going to have to rely on it heavily here. Um, uh -huh. because I think lots it, of people will be familiar with 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 some of it. But. Okay, so the the main idea is that you can do a sort of an inference to the best explanation diagnostic and explain a lot of stuff. Um, and, and I'm finding increasing convergence uh, with other people. A lot of sort of symptoms in our culture right now. Um, increasing suicide, especially uh, among the uh, among the young, the rate of suicide is even increasing. Anxiety, depression, loneliness. There was a survey done in the UK, I think, in 2017. 89 percent of adults said their lives were completely meaningless. Um, and we know that, contrary to what sort of our modern cynicism said, this this has very deleterious effects on people's cognition, their memory, their problem-solving abilities. Uh, you have the, you know, you have the opioid crisis, you have various addiction crises. Um, you have what's been called the escape into virtual reality, 
people preferring the virtual world over the real world. Reality is broken, as one book was entitled. Um, and, but you also see positive responses, like the revivals of Stoicism, the increasing interest in you know, the mind, what's been called the mindfulness revolution. It has problems. I'm not, I'm not proposing any of these as unproblematic. I'm proposing them as symptomatic, right? We have, we have the emergence of communities like this. Um, and we have an increasingly, uh, contrary to what, how I started within academia, within psychology, cognitive science and philosophy, wisdom is now a hot topic and philosophy as a way of life is now a hot topic. I think a, a unified way, and there's other things that the, the, the increasing the uh, uh, demographic of the nuns, the NONESs who have no particular religious commitment, they are not contrary to what some people wanted to convince us. They are not all new atheists like, you know, uh, uh, um, people like Harris. Um, uh, in fact, most of them uh, fall under this nebulous category which is um, confusing and confused of spiritual but not religious, in which what they mean is they're trying to cultivate meaning in life, self-transcendence, they're trying to overcome self-deception, et cetera. So that's the symptomology of the meaning crisis. That's a diagnosis. And, the, and, the, and then the idea is that the argument is that the very processes that make us adaptively intelligent make us perennially susceptible to self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior. And this has to do with the sort of core of my cognitive scientific work, a process I call relevance realization. And I won't go into it in detail right now, but the main idea is like this. You cannot pay, notice how I'm gonna invoke intention here in salience. I can't pay attention to all the information available to me. It's, it's overwhelming. And you think that's just now because of the internet? It was always the case. The amount of information is overwhelming. The amount of information you have in your long-term memory is overwhelming. The, the, the possible combinations of actions you can perform are overwhelming. And yet this is what you're doing right now. You're zeroing in on the relevant information like that. That's the thing that absolutely fascinates me because that is the thing we are, we, that is the piece that's missing from uh, the AI project. That's the thing that we keep bumping up against that we can't solve. There's a version of it in AI called the frame problem. I won't go into that in great detail. The point is, and this is not what you do. You don't check all of the information and go, that's irrelevant, that's irrelevant, that's irrelevant, that's irrelevant, because that would take you well beyond the rest of your lifetime, in fact, the lifetime of the universe. So that's not what you do. And this will sound like a Zen Cohen, and I mean that with a little bit of irony. You have to intelligently ignore most of the information. That's what makes you an intelligent cognitive agent. Here's the price you pay for it. You're ignoring information. And sometimes the information that you're ignoring is actually the relevant information you need. So the information you're treating as relevant, the information that is salient to you, obvious to you, is sometimes what you should not be paying attention to. Mm -hmm. So... And I think you can make a good case for this. Cross-culturally, cross-historically, you see communities of people coming up with ecologies of practices. A single practice won't do this. You need a bunch of practices that are dynamically self-organizing that help you ameliorate the self-deception that is unavoidable in the use of your intelligence. I want to call that going back to the Socratic tradition and very different from our very logical notion of rationality, I want to call that process of systematically and reliably overcoming self-deception so you can systematically and reliably set, uh, uh, reach your goals. I want to call that rationality. I want to call that rationality. And I want to say, if we acknowledge that there is not just propositional rationality, logic, but a rationality of attention and a rationality of character, and a rationality of identity and a rationality of consciousness, then we can think, and, and again, I can provide cognitive science and psychological evidence for all of it. There's, a rash, there's rationalities for each one of these. And then here's the possibility. There's a possibility of a meta-rationality that meta-perspectivally coordinates these all together so they can optimally help each other and constrain each other. I would suggest that that's wisdom. And here's the thing. I can ask you where you go for information I can ask you where you go for knowledge. 
Where do you go for wisdom? Where do you go? What role models do you have? What traditions do you have? What ecologies and practices? Because here's what is not optional to you. You cannot say, well, I'll just not take that up. Because the degree to which you don't take that up is the degree to which you're beset by self-deception, self-destruction. You know what that does? That eats away at your ability to connect yourself to each other and to the world. And that's what meaning in life is. Meaning in life is not having some grand purpose. This is what the research on meaning in life, I do work on that too, is showing. Meaning in life is how things matter to you, how they make sense to you and how you matter to them, how you are connected. And when you fall into self-deception, self right, destructive behavior, you're cut off from reality. And you know what you really want? You don't want that. I do this with my students all the time. I ask them, put up your hands if you're in a satisfying romantic relationship, which is the equivalent for most people of religion these days, right? Their romantic relationship is where everything is supposed to be met. They put up their hands. And I say, keep up your hands if you would want to know if your partner was cheating on you, even if that would, would destroy this relationship. 95% of them keep up their hands. And when you ask them why, they say, well, I don't want it if it's not real. And they don't mean anything metaphysical or Hegelian or thing. They mean they want to feel connected to it. They want to be in touch with it. So the meaning crisis is this. For historical reasons, we have lost, we've lost the, we've lost a community that will foam, and I use that word very deliberately, an ecology of practices that will allow us to cultivate wisdom. And what I mean by wisdom is the systematic and reliable reduction of self-deception and the systematic and reliable enhancement of a sense of connectedness to yourself, to others in the world that's meaning in life. We don't have that. And when we don't have it, we suffer deeply and profoundly. That's the meaning crisis. Mm -hmm. I see ancient philosophy, which is focused on wisdom and the transformative ecologies of practices, because that's what Stoicism is, that's what Platonism is, right? That's what Epicureanism is, an ecology of practices that will transform us in a way that will uh, allow us to reliably cultivate wisdom, put us in a tradition, and potentially give us the wherewithal to create viable communities within which we can practice it. Mm. There, that was the best condensation I could do. I know it was a long. But... That was very good. Thank you, John. I really appreciate that. Um, now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you another difficult one. Um, I guess part of the kind of value crisis and meaning crisis is the sense that science has undermined traditional religious belief and um, undermined the traditional source of values without yep. necessarily giving us new values. Yes. yes. And yes. one of the reasons people have got excited about mindfulness and about modern stoicism uh, and about humanistic psychology in the 60s is this sense, well, maybe we've got now a kind of empirical spirituality. Uh, like, you know, like, and, and the Dalai Lama has said, we need a new kind of scientific ethics for the 21st century. And that was some of the idea behind places like the Mind and Life Institute. And yep. people like Massimo Pigliucci can say, um, you know, stoicism, there's evidence for stoicism. Yes. Look at the evidence from CBT. And then you have this argument between, uh, let's say, someone like Robert Wright, who says why Buddhism is true, like science has proved yes. Buddhism is true. And then your colleague, Evan Thompson, who said, yep. I can't remember, but his recent book said, why I'm, actually, why, why I'm not a Buddhist. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And he says that, you know, the science of mindfulness has overclaimed and, and there's yes. things about Buddhism yep. that can't be proven. And uh, now that's a, such a big topic. But what's, you know, what's because it sounds like you are interested in this relationship between ancient wisdom, uh, yes. wisdoms and modern science. And what is that relationship? I mean, can modern science prove ancient wisdom or? Well, it depends what you mean. I mean, uh, uh, if I don't, if you mean prove it as some sort of an apologetic project, no. Uh, I think any, any, any nostalgic attempt to, I'm gonna be a shaman, or I'm gonna be a platonic sage, or I'm, I'm gonna be a Buddhist monk, it's like, um, I, I, I'm very critical of that. And, and, and I, I, I have published 
on mindfulness itself called reformulating the mindfulness construct because for example the way mindfulness was brought into western psychology was was, was in, in, in cognitive scientific terms an absolute shambles it doesn't mean that all the empirical evidence is bad there is good empirical evidence in there but it means a lot of it is bad and a lot of it should be thrown away because it, uh, i'm not going to i'm not going to grant it special privilege because it came from buddhism and, and and that's evan's point and evan's point also is you know, th there's a bit, there's a dodge going in there because what people do is they, well, you know, what I mean by Buddhism, and then what they do is they exclude all the things that have, you know, metaphysic are metaphysically questionable. Well, I'm a Buddhist, but I don't believe in rebirth or karma. Like if you do that kind of move, and, and then he says, well, then of course it's not going to be a coincidence. You're not. There's no apologetic argument there because you've so shaped it uh, by a sci kind of scientific winnowing that of course it's going to be consistent. You shaped it to be so. So it's no proof of anything. So I, I, I regard, I, yeah, I, I, I regard all of those move, moves as illegitimate. So I, I prefer another notion, which is a notion taken from cognitive science, evolutionary biology, which is the notion of exaptation. Um, and, and I'm, I'm going to, I'm stretching it, uh, uh, but I want to point out that there's a very important thinker right now, a group of thinkers centered around the work of Michael Anderson saying, Right, that most of how the brain works is what's called circuit reuse cognitive exaptation. The brain will make a machine. I have to speak anthropomorphically because language makes me do that. Right, the brain, the brain will make a machine for doing one thing, and then that machine is already pre-adapted, all, all, almost ready-made for another thing. So I take the part of the brain that's really good for manipulating my right hand, right, and doing all this fine-grained coordination and articulation, and I use it for articulating speech. Or, to use one of my favorite examples, I use this thing, which was evolved for poison detection and moving food around. That's why many organisms have tongues. And I use it for this cognitive purpose, which is called language. I can use my tongue to alter sounds coming out of my face hole so I can change ideas in your mind. Right? That's acceptation. I think that what the cognitive science can do is it can help me to really understand I, with Igor Grossman and a whole bunch of people, mo mo most many of the major pe people in psychology and neuroscience and cognitive science right now, we published a consensus paper on wisdom in psychological inquiry, like in 2019. Like, right? So, is there, you know, and, and by the way, a meta perspectival ability is a central ability. That's why the view, that connects to the view from above. So mm -hmm. we can we can do the science to learn about, you know, how does cognition, how does consciousness work. How, how do, how, how do, how, what's going on in mystical experiences? I've run experiments in my lab on that, right? We can do all of that. And then what we can do is look back at these traditions and we can exact them. We, we cannot just salvage them. We can take them and transform them okay. uh, into practices. Science won't give us that, right? And, 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 and the thing about science is the, 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 the science, sorry. The science that is going to address how science got us here is cognitive science. That's properly its project. Cognitive science is the task of trying to complete the scientific revolution. I don't mean historically, I mean structurally. We have scientific explanations for everything except how we generate scientific explanations. Science and scientists have no proper place in the ontology given to us by science. That's a whole, that's a fundamental mistake. That launches us into perpetual, what Whitehead called performative contradiction. We're always pretending as if we don't exist, yet we're the people that are practicing the science. But cognitive science is trying to answer that question. Uh, uh, now, I, I don't say we have answered it, but I will say we are making tremendous progress in it. And here's where I'm placing my academic, epistemic, and my career bet. That 4E cognitive science is, as it's getting answers to those questions, is actually getting answers as to why these practices for, were efficacious and transformative and are viable for people. And mm -hmm. so it's possible to create a dialogue, if you'll allow me that self-referential pun, between science and ancient wisdom spirituality, such that something is viable for us now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, I guess there's... The well, I, I mean, I, I'll leave it to the kind of to the to the group discussions, but there's a kind of there's the ethics thing, isn't there? Like CBT and mindfulness, they take the practices 
but they they leave the ethics and they leave the metaphysics. And I just I, I don't know if you can kind of get the ethics and the metaphysics from the kind of the rabbit of that from the hat of of of, of, of scientific method. But oh, do you know what I don't I, mean? I don't think you can. And so I mean, so you've got to got to say, look, these are my values. These are my ethics. Yeah, and I mean, you do have to have you you do have to have um, what Hedo calls you know a vision of the good life, and and he, he uses the word vision appropriately. I mean. Because most of this is with it's about perspectival. It's not about sort of assertion of belief. Um, however, I mean, so this 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 takes me to the sort of the borderland between cognitive science and philosophy. Now, that's an appropriate borderland because philosophy is one of the contributing disciplines to cognitive science. So this is, I mean, and this has to do more with my my work on Spinoza and Whitehead and people like that and all of these debates that are going on right now. Uh, about the fundamental ontology that is needed to do cognitive science. One of the things I would say is that naturalism, sort of a broadly construed non-reductive physicalism or something like that, um, which I think it, you need to do cognitive science. I, ah, I can't make that, I, I can make that argument, but I don't have time. But here's what I want to say, that we should we should be including in naturalism, not only the things posited by our science, we should be including in it those things that are presupposed by our science. Um, this is why I'm interested in Gerson's work. The idea that um, the, the central epistemological question is not, how do I know? The question is, what does the world have to be like such that it could be intelligible? Um, and, and then um, it, can you, and I, I, I'm not gonna just try and dodge the is ought problem or something like that. Uh, but the idea that, like I said, you can appeal to potentially universal notions that human beings find intelligible contact with a deep reality, just inherently good, inherently desirable. And they and and the work I've done on higher states of consciousness and ontonormativity, when people have that experience, very powerful. It is a it trumps. They will they will change their lives and their identities reliably, and from by objective measures, they get better. Uh, in order to stay closer and in conformity to that that really real. Um, now, the interesting thing about that really real is it doesn't seem to have a, a distinct propositional content other than sort of vague notions of oneness and realness and things like that. Um, and so for me, I guess what I would try to say, you're, you're absolutely right. The cognitive science can't give me the ethics and it can't give me the meaning. What it can do is legitimate a home uh, but it could also be rendered consistent with a vision of a good life. It can't deductively generate it, but if we talk about presupp I can build back into my presupposition for doing my science into something that is much more comprehensively a vision of the good life, then at least it, it, I think that's an, it, that's an intellectually respectable way in which I could link the science to the ethical or normative question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Um Okay, look, last question then, because I'm sure the audience um, have questions too, and I, I see lots in the chat. Um, I, I guess I, like you, um, I'm, well, I'm, I'm not in academia anymore. I was, and I was interested in the idea of um, trying to help people to flourish and not being embarrassed about that. Like yeah. philosophy is like, the, you know, how to flourish, how to, how to, how to have a good life. Like and but um, academic colleagues are, are, are very wary about that. And they say, "Look, that's not my job." They've got students coming to them now. There's a whole kind of mental health crisis among undergraduates, and they're you know they're like, "Look, I, I, it's not. I don't know how to make you happy. I can teach you, you know, facts about Epicurus uh, or about Stoicism and stuff, but it's not my job to to you know. I, I I'm not a you know a, a philosopher in that ancient sense, uh, uh, you know." Um, like Epictetus was or something, but w clearly w what we we've seen, I guess you know, s since the the sixties or even before, people like Abraham Maslow, there was something of the, of the kind of rabbi about Maslow, right? And he was a hugely popular figure in the sixties, more than just a professor. Um, in in the last ten years, your colleague Jordan Peterson is 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 yes, a, a kind of, of Old Testament prophet, isn't he? Yeah, well, um, and, he wants to be Moses and I want to be Socrates. That's the difference between us. Yes, yes, <laughs> he is. So I'm just curious about where do you see that? Well, how do you see your your role um, 
has, has, has it ever been challenging for you within academia? Um, have oh, you ever felt kind of pushback? Yeah, for a very long time. It was like um, I, they didn't know what to do with me. Um, they couldn't deny that I was um, having like my student, I was getting great student evaluations and my students were going on to grad school and they couldn't like, so they, they, they couldn't sort of objectively like say, you're not doing your job. They couldn't do that. But it was like, what are you doing? Like, you're not doing what we do. Uh, but after things fell apart in 2008, the university sort of went down, right? And then it rebuilt like this. Things turned around. Um, and that's, and I've been there since 94 teaching. So that was a long time and things turned around and suddenly there was a difference. And, um, you know, they basically created a tenure track for me and put me on it and got me tenure. And, and so there was this, and it was like, it's, it's, the change was already happening, right? Cognitive science was rising because of another one of my colleagues, Jeffrey Hinton, right? U of T, right? U of T, right? And so, uh, there were, so I was in a place where there had been people, you know, like Evan and uh, Jeffrey Hinton, and there were people like Jordan Peterson and my friend and colleague Jeff McDonald, who 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 who, who did this. So, um, I again, lucky Kairos for me. I mean, I they, I was on the edge of being kicked out, and things changed, and now I am where I am, and I didn't bring that about. It was things changed around me just at the right time. And do you think do you think of yourself as teaching wisdom? <laughs> I teach people how to love wisdom, which is a different thing, right? Um, uh, I mean, I teach them the best theories we have now of wisdom, uh, but I don't claim to be wise. I claim to have some knowledge about how people can become wiser, because I think that's what the science shows. And I have three decades of personal practice and community practice. Uh, so I, I think of that. And I do think, like I said, there is now a change. I mean, I'm meeting people in academic philosophy. I, I know Laurie, L.A. Paul, Transformative Experience, Agnes Callard, Aspiration. These are now central topics. You know, the philosophy of mysticism is, is, is just booming because of the psychedelic revolution. And then also there are, there, there, you know, you have Rand Lahav in philosophical fellowships, right? And, and you have philosophical counseling. And right, and you have all these movements that are out there that are now in taking the role of what the ancient philosopher did. And you have street epistemologists, and like so. People, people are now just basically giving the finger to people in academia, saying, "No, philosophy is just here, and it's just this." That is now just by fiat that is disappearing. Um, so mm -hmm. I think the burden of proof is now on the people inside to justify their position rather than them pointing their finger at people outside because that's where all uh, where increasingly I see both really the cutting edge academic work. I mean, L.A. Paul's work on the book, Transformative Experience, she literally wrote the book on it. And Agnes Callard's book on aspiration are some of the best books in philosophy in the last 10 years. And that's not a coincidence either, right? And like I said, you know, all this stuff that's going on in philosophical counseling and philosophical fellowship, it, it's just booming. Uh, and mm -hmm. so it's like uh, y y your book, the popularity of your book, like, like the, 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 you know. The, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, well, thank you for those uh, for that and for those recommendations. Well, I haven't read Agnes Callard yet, but I obviously I should. But I, I think you're right. Academia is changing. Philosophy is changing. I think it every change brings new issues as well. Like yeah. you think about like the scrutiny that Jordan Peterson came under in the last two years, right? This yes. is partly you set yourself up as a prophet. People look at your life, you know, like with the ancient philosophers, they, they were whole books, the lives of the ancient philosophers. No yep. one cares about the life of the modern academic, really, because it's just about their knowledge, not about, you know, it goes back to the idea of philosophy as a way of life. So if we're teaching philosophy as a way of life, our lives start to become part of the test of it. Right. Yeah. Which, and, is, and which is a tricky. It's an awkward position for me, at least. It, well, it's, it's an awkward position for me, but um, I mean, my, my, my own, I mean, since way back when, before, before cell phones and before Michael, right, when I encountered uh, Socrates, I mean, that has been, and I mean this in Agnes Callard's sense, that, I, that has been my, my aspiration to become more like Socrates. And I mean, one way of interpreting Stoicism, I think a, a defensible way, 
is the project of internalizing Socrates. Um, and like in the way Vygotsky talks about how we internalize adults as children. Uh, and I think there's a direct parallel there. So I've lived my life by that. And I take very seriously the responsibility that, so I, I want to be careful here because I don't, I'm not want I don't want to, I'm not trying to set myself up. But what I, what I say is I, I have to as much, for, for me to be teaching what I'm teaching in a way that is not a performative contradiction, I have to exemplify it as much as I express it. And I, I am committed to that. That's important to me. And I try, that is, that is sort of a central, uh, maxim and rule of life for me. I'm not claiming to be Socrates or anything like that, but I claim that I take that very seriously. I try to, I, 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 I practice, you know, a couple hours every day practices that are designed to keep me tempted towards that good. I, cultivate friendships and community that realize that. And so I think you're exactly right. I think what we're talking about here puts a responsibility on us, because you included yourself, so I, I feel free to do that too. It puts a responsibility on us that our, our, our pure academics didn't have. Um, and and I, 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 all I can say to that is I take that responsibility seriously and it's important. And I think it also would have been good in the past if we had paid a little bit more attention to the character and lives of our professors, uh, <laughs> given some of the things that we have uncovered. Um, mm. So, yeah, here, here. Uh, um, John, thank you. Okay, um, let's uh, let's take uh, some questions. Uh, in your discussion of, oh, let me, <clears throat> yeah, in your discussion of like deriving values from science, uh, there's a. Yeah, and like sort of like at the time, yeah, and the work of the new atheists. But basically, my, my question is like that can sound like two things. One is deriving our values from the content of science, as in like whatever, knowing when the first fiber bundle of nerves develops in a fetus, etc., like just the facts. Or there's also the method of science of generating hypotheses, checking them, updating our model. So from the former, I wouldn't expect to be able to derive like a code of ethics or anything. But the second one that sounds like that does belong in the toolkit with which to, I don't know, derive, invent, depending on your know, ontological stance on ethics. So like, yeah, I, I think, just wonder like, where does this sound reasonable to you? Sorry, you cut out there for a sec, so I interrupted you, I, I apologize. Okay, yeah, I was just wondering like, does this sound reasonable to you? What do you make of this? Cause I realize it isn't coming together as a coherent question. No, no, it's fine. It's a good question. Um, so first of all, I, I think uh, I, I agree very, uh, very much with what you said about, you know, uh, at the epitome, uh, sorry, at, not the epitome, although it's the epitome perhaps of science, but at the epicenter of science, the scientific method isn't really a method if you do enough philosophy of science. It's, it's, a, it's, a, family of, it's a family of practices that form an ecology of practices, um, which is very analogous to what I've been talking about here. And at, at the epicenter of that is overcoming self-deception. I mean, the, uh, the, the central thing in science is if we just use our untutored intelligence, even with the best of intent, and the best of our intelligence, we are most liable to get it wrong because our the processes by which we think are really riven and distorted by all kinds of bias. And so science is an ecology of practices for overcoming self-deception because we want to be in touch with what's real for its own sake. Well, well, yeah, there, there. So there's a vision of the good life embedded at the core of science. That's what I mean about. What is presupposed by doing science? If, if you didn't have individuals that had some buy-in to that vision, there wouldn't be science. And so that can help underwrite, you know, well, if you think that this is a legitimate thing to do, this is also a legitimate thing to do. Notice how they have exactly, you know, the same or at least analogous structures. So very much the practice of science. I do think the content of science, you have to be really careful here because the content of science is, is 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 rapidly changing all the time, and I think Laudan is right. He has what's called the you know the inductive pessimistic argument. We know from all of the previous history that ninety nine percent of our theories turned out to be false. So we have to be very careful about asserting our ontologies. Um, but I do think that, for example, uh, knowing about how our cognition works puts important constraints on how we propose the good life to somebody. Uh, there are models of the good life out there that propose abilities and capacity that rely, that presuppose abilities and capacities that human beings don't have. 
that human beings don't have. And therefore we should say, well, that isn't like, you know how many times you'll, you'll read something and, and somebody will say, well, the thing to do is you check all of the relevant evidence. It's like, well, really? Like, is it, yeah, like, so let me give you one example. This is vague. I'm going to make it concrete. Go to some stuff I published. So you'll read about people saying, you know, human beings make these mistakes. They don't use, you know, they don't use formal probability when they're making their probability judgments. Silly human beings. Look at them. You give them this and they make these silly judgments about probability. They do things like this. They'll judge how probable an event is on how easily they can imagine it happening. And oh, why don't they use, you know, why don't they use Bayesian probability? Well, the thing is, if you tried to do Bayesian probability for real world events, it's computationally intractable. It's computationally explode. This is Christopher, you know, I mean, you know, Cherniak made this argument, you know, in the 80s, in a book called Minimal Rationality. I can't lay that obligation on you. Odd implies can. Yes, is does not imply should, but ought implies can. If I say on you, you, you know what you should do? You should always use formal probability. That's asking you to commit cognitive suicide. You won't be able to get out of bed in the morning. So knowing that tells me that that normativity that is being presupposed by the scientists when they judge people as irrational is something I can say on the basis of scientific evidence. You can't apply that normativity because it's not computationally tractable. See, the difficult question is not should, right? We shouldn't treat these two things as synonyms, rational and logical. Rationality isn't equivalent to, just like it's not equivalent to intelligence, it's not equivalent to being logical. The, que the question of rationality is this, the much more difficult virtue of knowing where, when, and what degree you should be rational, you should be logical. That's what it is to be rational. I got that ethic out of the science of how the cognition works. So I think both can help us. Mm -hmm. Of course, makes sense that the question is always to what degree is each rather than which, whether it's one versus the other. But thanks very much for that answer. I'd have to rewatch the recording a couple of times to digest it. I, I totally agree that, right, yeah, and, and that there's some sort of, you know, reflective equilibrium that has to come between them. I, I, I totally agree with that point. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hi, John. Um, oh. So uh, I was just listening to the previous um question and and i've been circling around uh this idea of um attention um our salience landscape being so deeply linked to to what you called earlier on this kind of um meta practice yeah. uh, that, that you called wisdom um and and i'm really wondering about about I feel like there's a direct link between the quality of our attention and the ability to achieve any kind of wisdom. And, and I'm wondering um, if you found, taking it back to Hado, if you found in this, in this text something about uh, attention and wisdom um, and, and how, how those two things of necessity, they seem to be, they seem to be deeply linked to me. They are. Um, and um, as I get older, I appreciate more and more little books, thin books, uh, because uh, the grave approaches. Uh, and, uh, one of the best little books I've ever read is The Sovereignty of the Good by Iris Murdoch. And one of the central arguments through that book is exactly that, you know, sort of the core of our, our, our ethical uh, uh, orientation and ability is to have what she calls adjust attention to things, to, to pay attention to things at, in a way that they deserve to be paid attention to. And it's really interesting because she uses that and it's really, uh, it could be equivocal, but I don't think it is because she's a good philosopher, right? She's really playing on the line between, you know, a, 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 a normative sense of just uh, and, and, and uh, you know, the sense of adjustment, uh, which, I th which I thought was really, really beautiful. Um, now I find similar things not quite as explicit but I read the sovereignty of the good because of Hadoop. Um, <coughs> similar things, um, and, but I, I, I think it was there is stuff in uh, in what is ancient philosophy, especially when he talks about uh, the Stoics and Prososh, uh, um, about paying attention to attention. Uh, but and there's more of that in um, philosophy as way of life because he talks about that quite a bit, and of course the view from above. 
Um, there's an extended essay on that. So it's definitely in what is ancient philosophy. Uh, I would recommend also that you could you can develop that idea more fully in some of the chapters from the anthology, Philosophy as a Way of Life. And then in addition, I would supplement that by reading The Sovereignty of the Good. Great. That's great. Because it's, it's I, I initially when you're talking about sort of looking in more Eastern practices and then discovering this in, in Western philosophy, I've, that resonated with me quite strongly that, that, that I haven't really looked in Western philosophy for this appreciation of wisdom in the same way. I, I, I've, I've, I've been looking in other directions. So, so that's very, it's very helpful. Thank you. Well, I'm glad you, you found it. So I, I want to follow up uh, and say something here because it, about ecologies of practices and, and Eastern and Western, not quite happy with those adjectives. I wish somebody would come up with better ones. Yeah. Uh, um, so anyways, uh, so w w what you can see is in mindfulness practice where you're training attention, what you're largely doing is trying to shut off the inferential machinery, the inferential propositional machinery. Why do we do that? Because we have very good evidence and I I've got l lots of stuff that would could back this up. We have very good evidence that that machinery in interferes with our capacity for insight. Insight is when we realize that we have misframed things, when we have the aha moment, and we realize that we're making salient things that are actually irrelevant, and we're treating things as irrelevant, we're backgrounding things that should be foregrounded. And I've done a lot of work and continue to do a lot of work on insight. And mindfulness practices enhance insight, and they shut off, right, the inferential. But, but those same processes that we we love and we when we like when we love them we call them insight when we don't like them we call those same practices jumping to a conclusion because i can trigger that same machinery in you right now here's a pond of water it has a lily pad on it the lily pad doubles in number every day so on the second day there's two days next day there's four lily pads on the 20th day the pond was covered in lily pads on what day was it half covered and your brain wants to say day 10. And the answer is day 19, the day before. The part of your brain that makes you capable of breaking out and it's called cognitive leaping that makes insight possible is also the same thing when you're trying to make an inference that makes you jump to a conclusion and mess things up. So you need another practice to counterbalance the mindfulness practice, you need what's called active open-mindedness. You need to learn about all the ways in which that machinery can cause you to jump conclusions, confirmation bias, right? My side bias, all the biases. And you have to train yourself when you're inferring to look for them and hold them at bay. So you see what I'm showing? These are, these are counterbalancing practices, mindfulness and active open-mindedness. And there's no final solution between them. You need, you need this kind of constant opponent processing. That's why I call it an ecology of practices. And so if, if, if the West lacked uh, enough, atten enough attention to attention that you, right? I don't find enough worry about protecting inference in Eastern, the Eastern philosophy that I'm familiar with. Great, uh, Tim. Yeah, I had a, a question on a, a ecology of practice, and, and that I uh, I got a lot from your your meditation and contemplation course that you that you put on on YouTube, oh, uh, and I I find myself uh, torn between that that uh, the the being and the doing mode, and mm -hmm. uh, as soon as you said, I think you you spoke to uh, you, your ecology of practice is a couple of hours a day, and that that made me feel abysmal about how little time I spend on those. And so I'd, oh, I I'd, I'd love to know if you could just speak more a little bit about the what your, your ecology of practice looks like right now. Okay, uh, I'll do that, but take it uh, as encouraging and not as authoritative, okay? Because uh, I, like, Part of this, part of this is your ecology of practice should, it has to, it has to do a bi-directional, it has to tailor to you, and it also has to fit you to tradition and a community. It has to, I mean, it has to move both ways. This is a point made by Clifford Geertz, worldview attunement. It has to do both of those. So if, as long as you caveat that in your understanding. So I'll, I'll get up and I, I will do a, a, a lot of embodied practices. First of all, I'll do some yoga. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I've done yoga for about five or six years. I'm not great at it, but, but I use it basically preparatory. Um, 
I do it in preparation because then I do practices that I have been practicing for decades, which are, uh, you know, uh, Tai Chi Chuan, uh, a slow form, a fast form, and a weapons form. I do a, a standing practice called Jan Zheng, a moving practice called Yi Chuan. Um, so I, I do all of those. And there's all, there's lots of good cognitive scientific reasons for doing those. And then I sit and I do, uh, you know, a, a meditation practice, form of Vipassana. And then I do a contemplative practice, a form of meta, and then I do a prajna practice that integrates the two together. Because you should be scaling down and scaling up attention. You have to know how to break frame in meditation and make an alternative frame in contemplation. Uh, and I, those two, two terms should not be used as synonyms. They are not synonyms, and they shouldn't be used as synonyms. Then after that, um, I go into Lexia Divina, which is a practice where you learn how to read a text in order to read it transformatively and not just to get information. You sort of chant the text, you let it resonate with you, you associate with it, and then you do a set of practices to, to try and uh, you know, presence the perspective of the text, not just get the proposition. And you open your, you try, you try to turn the text into something analogous to what you're doing in the view from above. So you're experiencing the perspective of the text. Uh, and I take one from poetry and then one from prose. For, for example, this morning I read one of the, a proposition by Spinoza on the intellectual love of God. And I go from trying to understand it this way to doing something that he actually recommends. He calls it scientia intuitiva. What's the vision of reality that, right, that I should take from which I should understand that proposition? Then I read some Neoplatonic texts, do a similar practice. Um, then um, I read from uh, a Stoic, uh, the Daily Stoic, uh, and do a, a, some Stoic practices around that. And that's it. That's it, usually. Um, right now, I'm supplementing that by reading a book on called The Spirit of Spinoza. And the author there, I forget the author's name, I apologize. He, he, he's generated a whole pedagogical program of exercises derived from the ethics that you can do in conjunction as you read Spinoza's ethics in order to cultivate Scienza Intuitiva and not just have an argumentative understanding of Spinoza, but get what Spinoza wanted you to get, which is what Spinoza calls blessedness. And that's what I typically do every morning. So if you, um, I mean, you, you, you gotta get up a little bit earlier. But what I can say, one more thing, because that sounds sort of terrifying and I don't mean it to do. This is what I can promise you. This is what, and I've been teaching students for 20 years. Initially, this is an extra huge demand on your schedule. No question of it. But once you make it a habit, in the sense we were talking about earlier, it more than pays back for itself. The amount of shit, sorry, the amount of crap that gets removed from my life by doing these practices and the fluency and the fluidity that it gives more than pays for the time I invest at the beginning of the day. That doesn't come immediately, but with persistence and diligence, it comes. I hope that answered your question. It did, thank you. So I wanna take a, uh, a question from Tariq. He has a, a great question, which is, um, are there ways to measure the extent to which one is wiser? And this gets to the kind of, you know, the mashup between science and ethics. Um, and, um, well, yeah, I'm just, what, what are your thoughts on that? So there are, uh, uh, so there are two ways uh, of doing that. One is you can take various models of what wisdom is, and what you can do is you can do, you can go through all the, all the procedures you have to do in order to make them reliable and valid. That doesn't mean logically valid. It means a different thing in psychology. It means that you have good evidence and reason to believe the measure is measuring the, the entity you're positive. You have to go through all of that. You can't just say, hey, we'll do this, right? And then what you do is various theorists, theorists have proposed these models and what you can, you can use a bank of them to evaluate how people are doing uh, with respect to how wise they are. You can also do a components measure. You can see, you can, this is called an individual differences methodology. You find a process that is a necessary component of the bigger thing. And, and you'll know that how, how well people do in this process is predictive of how they'll do in the bigger thing. We use that all through psychology and cognitive science. Because very often measuring the whole thing is very hard. Uh, because for, if I was to really measure, uh, you know, your wisdom, think about how many measures I have to take of you, right? Um, and so, but what, it, what you can do is you can measure, for example, how, how 
much cognitive flexibility do people have? And especially how much, how much does that translate into this meta perspectival ability? How good are people at spontaneously taking a perspective other than their own? How good are they at noticing their own acts of self-deception? People vary in that. And people measure, and they, they reliably vary in that, and you can measure and compare them. And, and, and please don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that's the only thing we measure. I'm giving that as an example of the kind of thing you can measure. And you can measure a whole bunch of things. Now, does anybody, go, we, 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 it was in Toronto again. Uh, we fought, when we were making that paper, we, when we had people present either physically or virtually, we called ourselves the Wisdom Task Force, which sounds Orwellian and really horrible. Uh, but nobody in that task force thought that we were measuring like what it is to be in, in we, were, we were measuring sagacity, what it is to be a sage or enlightened. What we were measuring is, right, this. Can we use these measures to reliably predict the kind of people that their community will in general select as being wise? Because asking people if they're, if they're wise is a useless thing to do. That's one, that's one of the most useless sources of it's, it's actually almost counterproductive. And then what you can see, like, and if you get, so if you get what you might call, you know, uh, you know, community consensus on an individual, and then you get convergence, well, that's a good plausibility argument that you're actually measuring something, right? This is, you know, th we did the same thing with IQ. We do all these things. <coughs> Does it predict intelligence? <coughs> well, the endless debate. But predicts academic performance, if you're likely to get divorced, your health. Right, how good you are at a whole bunch of other things. <coughs> and it lined up with teachers' judgments of their good students independently. That's why we believe, I mean, in fact, you know, measures of G are probably the single best measures we have of human beings. And I know people don't like to hear that. Here's the thing that will make you happy to hear. Measures of G are really powerful, but they, they are only weakly predictive of measures of R, your capacity for rationality. And while G is largely fixed, R is something that is completely malleable. You can get better and better and better at being rational. And that actually matters much more. So. Mm. Well, I think that's a, that's a great place uh, to, to end it. Um, John, thanks so much for your time uh, and your uh, enthusiasm uh, and your um, epiphany sparking uh, dialogos. Uh, so it's it's a it's a real pleasure um, to to to, um, to hear you uh, flowing. Um, well, well, thank you, Jules. It was great. You you asked great questions. I mean, at some point, I would like to talk to you at some point about you coming on my show and talking about your book, the the, the show I have called Voices with Ravaki, talking about people who are trying to you know bridge science and spirituality, and ancient philosophy, and modern life together. That would be great. I'd love that. Okay, excellent. And I'd like to um, thank everybody here too. The film you just watched was a conversation that happened in Rebel Wisdom's digital campfire. So to join conversations like this, to submit questions, stay for the after hours hangout to talk about the ideas in the films, and to practice and develop some of the skills we talk about on the channel, check out the membership options. There's three different levels of membership. Sensemakers get to join our regular Sensemaker showcase events with some of the most interesting thinkers around and also the monthly Wisdom Gym sessions, where we speak to and also have a chance to work with some of the world's best teachers and facilitators. Explorers can join the Rebel Wisdom Book Club sessions, the monthly Philosophical Journey sessions, and also the regular Skills Academy to practice skills like mindfulness, sovereignty, and sense-making. And from now on, all members get to join our monthly AMA sessions with us, where you can ask any questions about anything to do with Rebel Wisdom.